I got to do one more video on this book uh, by Berlinski because if I'm going to say something favorable on a topic, I need to flip it and say something against. You know, that's what I've been trying to do with the atheist videos. I've been trying to show pro atheism arguments that I think are better than the ones being made, and then con atheism arguments that I don't see being made that ought to be. So we're going to get into kind of both sides of that here. Um, we're going to focus on, and I hopefully this Kindle thing won't be too annoying. Okay, um, I'm going to, it's going to, just look at those first two lines. The conclusion, the conclusion that a religious believer will take from Dawkins' argument is either that God is improbable or that he is necessary. Now, you have to have been reading the book to understand how Berlinski gets to this um, highlight or this, what do you want to call it, high point in his dialogue. All right, because it's a kind of dialogue. He's basically talking about Dawkins in Chapter 7, where we are now, on page 150 of the book. He's talking specifically about Dawkins in Chapter 7. And he's now, you know, getting to the point where he's going to knock down Dawkins' argument. The way he does that is he's making a plea to um, the logic in Summa Theologica by Aquinas, okay? And that's actually a whole series of books that Aquinas wrote. You can download it um, from Google Books. And you can also get it online at Amazon for Kindle. It's a lot of writing. Aquinas is kind of, what, what do you want to call it, wordy. All right. So Berlinski is using the logic part of Aquinas because even atheists and physicists, etc., kind of buy into the logic part. They just don't buy into the conclusions. Okay. Aquinas is arguing that God is necessary, therefore God exists. All right? Now, Berlinski isn't buying into the conclusion, therefore God exists, any more than Dawkins is buying into it. But it is a valid argument, according to Berlinski, to say that if something is necessary, that is a postulate, or really a hypothesis, that is valid to consider. If something is necessary, that implies that its existence would be necessary. And Aquinas is arguing that God's existence is necessary to explain everything else that we can see. All right. Dawkins, by contrast, using only natural law, because Dawkins is illogical, is saying that by terms of natural law that we can see, God's existence is improbable. Now, what's wrong with Dawkins here is so obvious. I don't know why people don't notice. The definition God, G-O-D, means somebody who put everything else in motion, therefore is above everything that he puts in motion. God is not natural. God is supernatural. Above nature, not subject to nature, but creating it. But Dawkins wants to cut God down to size and say, by the laws of nature, God is improbable. Well, yeah, hello, nature didn't create God. Then he wouldn't be God. He'd be a creature just like everything else. Duh. So Dawkins fails the immediate logic test. Because the first logic test, which you can see, you know, every bit of logic is reflected in math. A equals A. And it's got three horizontal lines between the first A and the second A, if you're expressing it as an equation. A is identical to A. That's one, one of the, you know, things you learned in grammar school in math. A is identical to A. You are identical to yourself. Your house is identical to, to your house. Okay, well here he's saying A is not identical to A because he's subjecting something that by definition is not A, God, 
2A, which is natural science, and then calling God improbable. Well, duh. So Dawkins can't is illogical, and therefore he's definitely unscientific. Science is based on logic. You mean atheist and a scientist? I'm not trying to debunk atheism. I'm debunking Dawkins. All right? You don't want to be an atheist? Fine. You want to be an atheist? Fine. That's your free right. Atheism has a lot of arguments that, that support it, but not anything coming from Dawkins, honey. Because if he's saying God is improbable based on the laws of nature, and that is what he's saying in his God delusion book, if he's saying that, then he just proves he doesn't know logic, and he therefore doesn't know science. Okay? So Dawkins is on the God is improbable side, which Berlinski is dealing with that argument here. And Berlinski is coming at Dawkins from the standpoint of Aquinas' argument that God is necessary. All right? Now, I'm going to dispute with both of those guys here. Okay, is my recording still on? Yeah. God is, if God is improbable, that actually argues for his existence. God's improbability by laws of nature, which is what Dawkins is invoking, would mean that he's probably the cause of nature. I deal with probability for a living. And one of the things you use improbabilities for is to search out probabilities. See, probability theory has two sides. A, the probability of X is 60%. Okay, so the improbability of A is 40% to add up to 100. In probability theory, everything always has to add up to 100%. This is what I do for a living, and you can check this with anybody you want. Probability theory always has to add up to 100%. Okay, so the probability, if it's 60%, means the improbability, the opposite, is 40%. All right? Now, probability theory is always based on observations of things that exist. So probability theory always is talking about the possibility of something outside the 100% occurring. This is, how your, this is how life insurance is calculated. What's the probability you will die this year? Well, that's based on statistics of thousands and millions of people, okay, over history, depending on the table that you use. And the insurance premium you pay is a function of the probability you'll die this year. All right, but something can happen that's outside the known, collected observations that can make you die or live. Like, let's say there's an improvement in medical treatment. Okay, let's, you know, because cancer 50 years ago, if you had it, the likelihood of your dying was extreme. Okay, but we've made lots of advances in cancer treatment since then. So now the likelihood of you recovering from cancer is also extreme. So probability changes with time. Okay, well, then if something is improbable, then the probability is small with reference to what? The universe of observations. I hope I'm making sense. I hope I'm not getting, I'm trying to dumb it down, and I don't know if I can do that. If something is today improbable, what changes the probability would be anything that is outside the 100%, the universe of observations. Here, the universe of observations is whatever Dawkins is declaring it to be, natural law in his idea. By natural law, God could not have come to exist by means of natural law. Well, duh because the definition of God is above natural law. You with me on this? This God, Dawkins is saying that A equals not A. That God cannot exist unless he's subject to the laws of nature. And since subject to the laws of nature, his existence is improbable, yeah, because of what God means, then therefore God doesn't exist. 
So you see, if you believe Dawkins, if you're an atheist hanging your atheism on what Dawkins wrote, throw him away right now or you're going to be a fool. Any Christian on earth can disprove you in five seconds if you're using Dawkins as your defense for atheism. Throw it away. Be an atheist or not, but don't use this guy. He can't think, he's not logical, and he's certainly not scientific. All right? Now, I don't, you know, um, what do you want to call it? Berlinski is using Aquinas, who's a believer, Summa Theologica, to say, to advance the argument that you can prove logically that God exists because he's necessary. All right? That's what Aquinas was trying to do. Berlinski is not buying into the conclusion that God exists because he's necessary, but he is using the argument, all right, because improbability is not a good argument. All right, so now Berlinski is actually exploring, not, you know, agreeing, but just exploring the argument that God is necessary. And that's what he does for the balance of chapter 7, all right? And one of the things he say, he's doing here is he's quoting Wittgenstein. He's saying that even when all possible scientific questions have been answered, meaning with respect to natural law, the problem of life remains completely untouched. Yeah, that is one of the big problems in science. They can't define life. Life is immaterial. That's the big problem everybody's having in science is that when a, an organism dies, like you cut a plant, the minute you cut a plant, that plant has died. You cut like flowers and you're holding them in your hand. They look like the very same flowers that were in the ground before you cut them. Everything biologically about those flowers is the same as before you cut them. But they're dead. How come? In other words, the circulation of the flowers will soon cease even though they look the same as they did before you cut them. How can that be? How can they be dead and yet all the biology is the same? It just isn't moving anymore. And actually just as in a human body, once it's dead, the actual cessation of movement takes a few minutes. Okay, or even longer than that. It's called rigor mortis. It's a, it's a process that takes place maybe over a couple of hours, all right? So life is not explained by science because life is basically immaterial. The Bible talks about that a lot. Life is in the blood of an animal, but life is not the blood of the animal. So in order to kill the animal, you have to, it, it, all of its blood has to leave it. That's why the, you know, the mosaic sacrifices were the way they were. Okay? Life is not material. A human being dies. And everything about that human being, let's say he just dies of disease. Everything about that human being is still intact. You can see the ravages of the disease on the biology. But you cannot determine how it got to the point where everything stopped. This has always been the bane of science, okay? The same thing of true, of course, is for the universe. We can't determine how it started. We see it going on now, but we don't know how it got started. And there's all kinds of, you know, ideas about how it might have gotten started. Okay, but it's immaterial to us. We can't measure it by biological, natural law, science means, okay? So... We feel, Wittgenstein wrote, that even when all possible scientific questions have been answered, the problems of life remain completely untouched. So, is God necessary as an explanation for what we can't explain? Aquinas, in his second proposition, third proposition, is saying, yeah, well, maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, Berlinski isn't buying into the yes, but he's saying this is a valid question. 
all right? Now, I disagree with both of them. First of all, God is improbable. Uh, well, duh, that would be proof of God, if anything. Okay, you can't say that God is God if he's subject to the laws of nature. So if you're saying that subject to the laws of nature, the existence of God is improbable, yeah, the, the laws of nature could not produce him, yeah, but God is not defined that way. God is above the laws of nature, or he's not God. Duh. So for Dawkins, God is only God if he's not God. Okay, so throw Dawkins out. That's easily dismissed. Okay. Is God, however, necessary to explain what we can see? All right. That is Berlinski's point of departure. He started it, I think, back in Chapter 2. We're now in Chapter 7 on page 150. Is God necessary to explain what we can see? Berlinski never says that God is, is necessary for what we can see. But he is saying that the proposition is a valid proposition. That's as far as he goes in his book. He doesn't believe that God exists or he's agnostic about it. All right, which is fine. All right, you know, that's where he's at with it. That's, that's fine. Okay, but my argument is that this is not a proper argument. Is God necessary to explain what you can see? Now, why would I, as a Christian, want to dispute another Christian, here Aquinas, because I read him, not everything in Summa Theologica, but a good portion of it. Okay, why would I want to dispute my fellow Christian here, who's regarded as one of the leading logicians of Christianity? And why would I want to dispute Berlinski? Okay. And I'll have to cover that in the next increment.